But what God's placed above my heart is as uh, I began preaching through the series of, of messages through Christmas time of the chronological order of the, the birth narratives. You know, years ago there used to be a, a saying, and some of you uh, probably remember that. I'm sure they even had bracelets and necklaces and all kinds of things. I think they even had t-shirts, WWJD. And so what did that stand for? What would Jesus do? Well, one of the greatest ways that we can figure out what Jesus did is to look in the Word of God. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually start following the footsteps of Jesus. And so I'm going to preach through a, a series of messages. I don't know how long it's going to take us yet. It might take us all year. Amen. To, to go through the, uh, all four Gospels and just look in that chronological order of what did Jesus do? What exactly did He do? And so we're going to be following the footsteps of Jesus. Amen. And so as we look at that, we'll see, you know, if, if, if I know, if I want to know what Jesus did, then I need to uh, or follow what Jesus did. Then I need to look in the word of God and see exactly what it is that Jesus did. And so here in Luke chapter two, beginning in verse 41, we find uh, the only reference to Jesus's childhood other than uh, when he was a baby, other than when, when he was first born, uh, the reference to him as an older child. And so what we find here in the Word of God, in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 41, the Bible says right here, Now when his parents went to Jerusalem every year uh, to the feast of the Passover, and when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the, of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it. But supposing him to be in the caravan, went a day's journey and began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. They did not find him. They returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers and when they saw him, they were ast astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you are looking for me? Do you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. Lord God, I pray for your anointing upon the preaching of your word this morning. I pray that you give us ears to hear, hearts to receive. And oh Lord, I pray that everything today that is said and done would be said and done to give you glory, honor, and the highest praise. And Lord, give us hearts to pursue you and follow you in every single way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here it was in the Word of God, we find that Jesus is 12 years old. And it's a very important time for the life of a young Jewish uh, boy because at the age of 13, that, that's when he becomes a man, right? According to Jewish custom, according to the law, that's the time when he is supposed to then start participating in all of the customs of the law. And so he's not just going to be a spectator anymore, he's going to be a participant in it now. And so as we look here in the Word of God, uh, we, we find that... It, it, as they went to Jerusalem, they went here for the Passover. And so as we see this, called, called the Feast of the Passover. So really what's interesting is really two feasts take place during this week. We find the first feast, and that is the Passover. That's the, the day of Passover. That's the Passover meal, which as we find in the Word of God, Jesus is our Passover lamb. So what is the Passover? Passover is all the way back in Egypt when there the Israelites had been enslaved for 400 years there it was that they'd been waiting for a deliverer Moses finally comes and and uh, God sends Moses back to Egypt and so he goes stands before Pharaoh ten times he tells Pharaoh to let his people go but uh, or well nine times he tells him to let his people go and all nine times he doesn't. There's different plagues that come up on the land. So the tenth time, Moses goes up to Pharaoh and he says, let God's people go. And so he said, this time, you know, all of those other plagues, this one's going to be really, really bad. The firstborn male child of every home is going to die. And so as, as we look at this, that, that was the plague that was about to come. But God gave an escape, gave a Passover to the children of Israel and what he told them 
going to do is take this lamb, not just any ordinary lamb, but this spotless lamb, this unblemished lamb, this perfect lamb. Every household was to take this lamb and they were to slaughter this lamb and they were take, to take the blood. They did many things with the lamb, but the, 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 what they did was take the blood of the lamb and they put it on the outside doorpost of their home. And as the angel of death was coming over them, it would then see that blood and it would pass over their home to where the firstborn male child of their home was protected. And so we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is that Passover lamb. Amen. As Jesus came up to the Jordan River and John the Baptist, who obviously knew Jesus, he saw Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Amen. And so Jesus, no doubt about it, was the Passover lamb, is the Passover lamb. And so when we also look at that, not only was the Passover celebrated um, th- th- this uh, um, week, but also it-, it was a festival of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. So they celebrated that as well. Guess who Jesus is? Jesus is the unleavened bread. To take the leaven out means that there's not any sin in it, right? Jesus was the spotless, unblemished Lamb of God who had no sin within Him. Who else is Jesus? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Amen? So as we partook in the Lord's Supper this morning, we recognize that Jesus truly is the bread of life. Through Jesus Christ, we have life. Through Him and Him alone. That's interesting as Jesus was here, he was 12 years old, he was participating in all of this, understanding that, you know, maybe Mary didn't understand it, maybe Joseph didn't understand it, nobody else understand, but Jesus is the Son of God, God, who became flesh. And so I believe the older Jesus got, the more he began to understand this is who he was. Amen. Maybe he didn't understand it all as a as a toddler, but I believe the older he got, the more he began to understand. Now he's 12 years old old next time they come and participate in the passover meal he's going to participate in it next time they come in uh with with the uh, unleavened bread he's going to participate in it and i believe he's getting more of a grasp now if if, if not he knew all of it uh, by this point that he was the passover lamb he is the passover lamb he is that unleavened bread he is the bread of life and so now it's interesting as we find this, we find a few things within this text of Scripture that I believe that if we take this and we apply this to our lives, that we're going to grow in our walk with Jesus Christ. Amen? Because here it is. It's New Year's Day. It's January the 1st. Everybody has New Year resolutions. Amen? And so as we have our New Year resolution, maybe it's to get in shape, maybe it's to lose weight, uh, maybe it's to say, man, who knows? Who knows what that New Year resolution uh, might be? But as Christians, our everyday resolution and absolutely our New Year resolution, our, 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 our commitment to God is that we grow closer to Him. Amen. And by January the 1st of 2024, if God still allows me to remain, then I want to be much closer to Him than I ever have been in my life. But as we look in the Word of God and we take these principles to heart and we begin to understand what's going on here, we, we we see the fact that we can and we should grow in our relationship with Jesus. So as an interesting fact, it was the man's responsibility to go to Jerusalem and participate in the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But the Word of God tells us right here in verse 41, it says, Now his parents, both of them, Mary and Joseph, went to Jerusalem every year of the Feast of Passover. And so we look at that, obviously they brought Jesus too, right? Because as they went and they spent that whole week there. It's been eight days there after the eight days, after it was over with, the Bible says. They they turned around, they went to go back home. They were with a caravan. It was very dangerous to travel by yourself, so they traveled with a caravan. It was probably uh, the, the, the caravan of Nazareth, right? They were going back to Nazareth, so it's probably all folks from their local town. They were traveling together. They get back and they uh, camp out for the night, and they, they get to look and say, okay, where is Jesus? 
Where, where's Jesus at? Now, you say, well, they must have been some kind of bad parents, right? They, they were some bad parents because they lost Jesus. <laughs> I mean, they didn't lose any ordinary child. Now, it's devastating to lose any child. This is Jesus, right? This is the Son of God. This is God who became flesh, and they lost Jesus. But, you know, this could have been a very easy mistake, and, and it probably was because, again, remember, he's 12 years old. So he could have been up front hanging out with the men because he's about to be considered a man. So Mary might have thought, well, he just went on up there with Joseph. Or he was still actually a, twi- a child. He wasn't 13 yet. He was only 12. So Joseph could have said, well, he's back there to he's back there with the women. But they were also with the caravan. And who was the caravan? Probably a whole lot of kinfolks, right? So they had a lot of their kinfolks. Really. He's, a, he's with Uncle Sue or Aunt Sue or, or not Uncle Sue, but un- Uncle Joe and Aunt Sue. We're not that kind of church. So uh, Uncle Joe and Aunt, or Aunt Sue, or whoever it is, right, are with them, or maybe he's hanging out with the cousins or something like that. So they weren't that worried about it because, you know, literally in this day and time, it, it took a village to raise a child, and they took that seriously. Amen. It used to be that way right here in this community, no doubt about it, that the whole, everybody raised that child, right? If you saw a child doing something they wasn't supposed to be doing, it didn't take long for mama and daddy to find out about it amen because it took the whole village to raise that child up and we were a lot better off when we were living in those days as well so here it was they camped out for the night wondering where Jesus was well they brought Jesus with them obviously so Mary didn't have to go it was only the man's responsibility to go and to do their duty to the Lord but Mary said you know what I'm going to go too and apparently is the wording we find here it's something she did every year, right? Something she did every year. And this was not an easy task to do. It was a very difficult, very time-consuming, consuming, very strenuous, a costly journey that was going to go and it was going to cost them something for them to go up there to Jerusalem and spend that time that week that eight days that they spent there in Jerusalem it was something that they didn't just up and do it was something that had to be planned out thought out and it was going to be time consuming and it was going to be costly but what were they going to do they were going to worship the Lord amen They were going to worship the Lord. You know, I hear all kinds of folks all the time say, well, I'm not going to go to church today because I've got other things to do or I've got more important things to do. Friends, there is nothing more important than worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And if we want children that are going to grow up and and, uh, worship Jesus, then friends, you need to raise them in church. Amen? You need to raise them uh, under the authority of the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. You need to raise them in that community that will help you bring them up that where we as a community the community might not necessarily be a community anymore but we as a church absolutely are a community and every child needs to be raised in that atmosphere and they will be blessed as a result of it. So I'm here today, I'm an adult. Well, you need to make a commitment that regardless of how much time it takes, regardless of how much it's going to cost you, regardless of how strenuous it is going to be, and let's all face it, we live in the United States of America, and it is not that difficult for us to come to church. Amen? It is a pretty easy thing for us to do. Now, I understand, you know, we've got some folks on vacation right now. We've got some folks that have to work sometimes on Sundays. You know, I'm not... I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there's not times that we can't be here, but our heart is to be here. Amen? And we need to make it that point. We're going to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? We're going to be there in the house of the Lord, and we're going to worship the Lord our God. And if my family is still in my home, they're going to be there with me. Amen? They're going to be there with me. I'm going to bring them right along with me. And so... They camped out for the night, found out Jesus wasn't there. They turned around and they came back. So the Bible says it was three days 
So they had a day's travel of getting to wherever they got to, leaving Jerusalem, no doubt. They had a day's travel getting back to Jerusalem, so that was two days. And then for one solid day, they walked around all of Jerusalem, figuring out where this 12-year-old boy is going to be, right? And so you could look today and say, well, where would 12-year-old boys be, be hanging out? Well, maybe, you know, they're, they're out at the ball field. Maybe they're, they're playing video games with their friends. Who, who knows what 12-year-old boys might be doing? And so they look probably at all the typical, where in the world would Jesus be? They finally go to the temple, and as they go to the temple, there Jesus is, right? There's Jesus. He is at the temple. And so when Mary asked them about this, and, and they, they, when, they, when they finally found him, it, it says right here in verse 45, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said, Son, why have you treated us this way? Well, I mean, you can only imagine how upset she was, right? Where in the world? You're 12 years old. Now listen, Jesus wasn't your ordinary child. Jesus is sinless. Amen? Jesus is sinless. So he didn't have all that mischievousness that's in every other child. And every child has a level of mischievousness in them. And, you know, children are going to be children. Right? By nature, we're children of wrath. That's what the word You don't have to teach a baby to be greedy. That's in their nature. That's my toy. <laughs> right? But Jesus is sinless. So it wasn't in his nature whatsoever to be disobedient to his parents, and he wasn't being disobedient to Mary or to Joseph. And so Mary was shocked. Mary was bewildered. She didn't know what in the world was going on. Why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Could you imagine? I mean, I could see Dale right now. I mean, she'd, she'd be in an outright panic attack and screaming at me because it was my fault. Right? And, and, and everything in the world should just be having an absolute heart attack. Amen? And so, by the way, I have lost Veronica before. So, I, just before she tells you that, I'll confess that in the Hattiesburg Mall briefly, but I still hear about it to this very day. I, I did lose her at one point. So, I understand. I, I recognize this pain. This is all day long. But Jesus' answer is phenomenal. Jesus' answer really brings us to an understanding that Jesus knew exactly what was going on, who he was, what his purpose was. He says in 40, verse 49, And he said to them, Why is it that you are looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Why were you looking for me? You should have known where I was at, Right? And Jesus wasn't being a smart aleck. He wasn't, you know, uh, uh, smarting off to his mom and, you know, saying something uh, to, to her that, that, that would have been a snide remark. No, he was, he was bewildered too. Well, where else would I be? <laughs> what else would I be doing? I'm in the Father's house. Now, a couple of things that are amazing about this point right here. This is the very first time in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, the very first time in Scripture that God is referred to as Father. Amen? And Jesus said, that's where I'm at. I'm in my, I'm in my your, your, your Father and I, that's what Mary said, your Father and I have been looking for you. Jesus said, I've been in my Father's house. Amen? I've been in my Father's house. Didn't you know I'd be here? While I was up there playing the guitar a little while ago, my phone started going off, and now I see I got a couple of texts. Why anybody would text me on a Sunday morning, I have no idea. They ought to know where I'm going to be. You know, I've only been a pastor for, you know, about 25 years now, and so they, they ought to know where I'm going to be on a Sunday morning, right? A few weeks ago, I got a, got a phone call. I was up here preaching. My phone starts going off, and, and, my, and I figure, well, it must be a telemarketer, and it was. It was spam. And so I didn't know who it was. If I don't know the answer to that, of course, I'm not going to answer it while I'm up here anyway. But obviously, I wasn't too worried about it because if somebody knows who I am, they know where I'm at on Sunday mornings, right? 
Well, Jesus literally is the Son of God, but guess what? So are we. Sons and daughters of God, we're joint heirs in Christ Jesus. We're adopted heirs in Christ Jesus because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We are sons and daughters of God. The Bible's not just clear about that, but it's extraordinarily clear about that. And we ought to have the same right. Where else would you expect me to be? I'm a son of God. I'm going to be in the Father's house. I'm I'm a daughter of God. I'm going to be in the Father's house. I'm going to be there. But you know, as Jesus was there, it's interesting, the Bible says right here, Luke refers to them as as teachers. And you know what? It was was custom. Secular history writes about this, and it was custom that during this feast of the Passover, they'd get the, the best of the best teachers of Jewish law that they could possibly find. Right? They'd get the best of the best, and they would come during the week of uh, Passover, and you would be able to listen to them, you'd be able to ask them questions, and you'd be able to glean from their wisdom the best of the best. I love going to uh, conferences to where, you know, um, Southern Baptist in, in Mississippi, we have uh, two conferences every year we have the mississippi baptist convention every year and then we we have also an evangelism conference every year next year the national convention is going to be in new orleans the same way with bma they have a state conference and they also have a national conference and you know who they invite to preach at those they invite the best of the best right they invite the best of the best And so when you go, you're going to be able to hear some of the best preachers and some of the best teachers of the Word of God, and you're going to be blessed by I love going to those. I get so lit up every time I go to those and leave so on fire. And there, Luke refers to them as teachers. It's the only time in the book of Luke that anybody other than Jesus is being referred to as a teacher. And it's also the only time in Scripture where it's referred to that Jesus is being taught. But Jesus went seeking them out. You're going to be a man next year who wants to hear the Word of God. He wants to hear the law of God. And the Bible says he was listening. You know, I never will forget before I got saved. I'd go to church sometimes. And I'd be able to leave church. I couldn't tell you a word that preacher said. I could tell you how many rows of pews they had. (laughs) How many rows of lights they had. If they had ceiling tiles, how many ceiling tiles they had. I'd do everything but listen to the preacher. Amen? Friend, if you've got a heart to grow, when, if you're in Sunday school, if you're in the worship service, you need to be listening. And listening, not just with your ears, but with your heart. Amen? How does this apply to my life as I take it in? So it, not only was he listening, but the Bible says he was asking questions. Asking questions. You know, if we're really going to learn, we need to ask some questions. And I love it when people ask questions. First of all, that tells me they were listening. Amen? They have a question. Well, let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's see what the Word of God has to say about it. Amen? You see, it's so vitally important that we understand what the Word of God says. I I hear people say all the time, I don't need to go to church because, you know, I, 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 I read the Bible myself, and I know the Bible myself. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let me pre- present to you evidence number one that they said they don't need to go to the church, which is evidence number one that they don't know their Bible. <laughs> Amen? Teachers are gifted by God. Teachers are called by God. To do what? To serve within the church. In fact, the Bible says to respect elders, especially those who teach. Amen? 
Therefore, we need teachers in the church. The Bible also says not to forsake the assembling of one another. Do you need to study the Word of God on your own? Absolutely, you need to study the Word of God. Because there's a lot of false teachers out there too. Amen? A lot of people are preaching some silly stuff out there. And we do need to know the Word of God on our own. But we need to be taught the Word of God. I still need to be taught the Word of God. Every one of us still need to be taught the Word of God. So we need to make that an absolute point, not just church on Sundays, by the way. Set aside a day, a, a, a time every single day that I'm going to spend quality time with the Father. And what am I doing? I'm not just reading the Bible that says, hey, I read through the Bible in a year. Awesome. How much of it stuck? Amen? Not the point of how fast you read through the Bible, how many times you've read the Bible, but how much of it stuck? Well, if you're there seeking the Father, Father, I want to spend time with you. Daddy, I want to spend time with you. Oh, it's going to stick. You're listening. You're asking questions. Because you want to know, and you want to grow, and you want to be the man of God or the woman of God that he has called you to be. Amen? So we help as a community to grow one another. Every one of us have a role in that. Every single one of us. About to have baptism here in just a second, and it's every one of our responsibilities to take that and those new believers and help grow them and mature them in their walk with the Lord. But if we ourselves are not seeking to grow, mature in the Lord, we're going to be of absolute no use to ourselves, to our family, spiritually, to our church, to anyone. Amen? We need to make that commitment. We need to make that firm commitment. Jesus, I want to know you more. I want to love you more. I want to serve you more. I want to be the man, the woman of God. You've called me to be. I know we're getting a little long on time here. Well, Michael, if you go ahead and go to the back and get ready. I've got something I want to share with you real quick before we start our time of invitation. As soon as invitation starts, I'm going to ask if Brother Kevin would come. In fact, if you want to, you can come up here right now. This is a song I wrote about at least 15 years ago. It's been a while. And I just want to share it with you before we start that time of invitation. In the stillness of the quiet hour, I will call you, Lord, I need your power. I'll come boldly, Lord, before your throne. By your grace, Lord, I am your own. I want to see your face, I want to hear your voice, I want to feel your embraces, 
In the stillness of your presence, I want to see your face. I want to hear your voice. I want to feel your embraces. In the stillness of your presence, in the stillness of your presence, Lord. In the stillness of the quiet hour, I will call you, Lord, I need your power. I'll come boldly, Lord, before your throne. By your grace, Lord, I am your own. I want to see your face, I want to hear your voice, I want to feel your embraces in the stillness of your presence. I want to see your face, I want to hear your voice, I want to feel your embraces in the stillness of your presence, in the stillness of your presence, Lord. In the stillness of your presence, I will bow down before you. In the stillness of your presence, I will worship and adore you. In the stillness of your presence, I will lift my praises to you. In the stillness of your presence, I will come before your throne. I want to see your face, I want to hear your voice, I want to feel your embraces in the stillness of your presence. I want to see your face, I want to hear your voice, I want to feel your embraces in the stillness of your presence, in the stillness of your presence, Lord. If you're here today, and you say, you know, I really don't have much of a desire to really seek you, God. First question you need to ask yourself is, are you saved? Are you truly saved? If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you are, then the second question you need to ask yourself is, what in my life is hindering my growth. What is it that I need to repent of? Amen. So if you're not saved today, would you come to know him? Just come take Brother Kevin by the hand. Say, Brother Kevin, I need Jesus. That's all you need to do. He'll lead you through the rest of it. Amen. But if you're here today and something's hindering you, do business with God this morning. Amen. Seek him. Right here, right now, today. This altar is open. Stoice is going to come up here and play. Brother Derwin's going to come up here and lead. You come as God stirs in your heart.